It was just a typical summer day in South Texas. At this time, I was just a little girl of 12 or so. I lived in a fairly secluded area at the end of the cul-de-sac, and of course, with southern weather, it was hot as hell. I think it was at least 98 degrees outside. My mother's Rottweiler had recently had puppies, but most of them died either due to the heat or illness, so only one was left. I brought food and water into the shed, the only source of shade, for her to eat so she had a better chance of having one living puppy. The last one did survive, for those who are curious. Though it was miserably hot outside, I suddenly felt dreadfully cold. Simone, the mother of the dog, didn't growl, but began wagging her tail, or nub, I should say, and stared forward. I had to look. I turned my head, and I saw a man, dressed all in a gray suit. He had a thick mustache, and was wearing a hat that looked like it could have been since 1910 or so. I opened my mouth to say something, being the impolite and outspoken brat I was, only to realize that I could see through his legs. He tipped his hat at me with a faint smile and walked, or drifted, on. Shocked and somewhat paralyzed with fear, I darted out of the shed and followed, only to see him disappear next to the ash tree that was starting to grow next to the house I lived in. That would have been the last time I saw him, but I never felt threatened by his presence. In fact, I felt safe. Every now and then, after my parents purchased another acre of land, I would see him standing in the woodsy acres of our yard, only for him to disappear when I blinked or looked somewhere else. I always felt like he was watching over me, but to this day, I'm still not sure. As I grew, I eventually fell in love with someone and decided to move away with him. I may have been just a teenager, but you know what they say, love makes you do crazy things, or hormones. I don't know, it was one of the two. I remember as I got into my dad's ugly green Toyota Corolla to head to the airport, all of my luggage loaded into the vehicle. I stared out the window as we pulled out of the driveway. What I saw out of the window brought tears to my eyes. The man in gray was waving, as if to say goodbye to me. His face never changes. It's pale white. His eyes are gray. Empty. Wide. So fucking wide. I can't take my own eyes off of them, and because I can't, I feel them painfully dry up. Just as his should, but they don't. They never close. He never closes them. He's always, always watching. His smile. That godforsaken smile. Just like his eyes, so impossibly wide. His teeth aren't touching. It's an open smile. I can see the black pit where his throat begins, always waiting for something sinister to crawl out. His teeth clamp down, just as I think I can see something moving behind them. They're sharp, but why are they spotted with red? He's always there. His albeared long fingers leaving my window steamed up in their shape. He'll stroke the glass a few times, but that's only before he'll start impatiently tapping it with each of its five individual yellow pungent nails, concisely taps starting from pinky to thumb. He's waiting, waiting for me to look away, but I can't. What will he do if I look away? I can't sleep. I might not make it until morning if I fall asleep now. Just keep watching. 
He won't do anything if I keep watching. My eyes are getting heavy. I don't know how much longer I can stay awake. My lids are fluttering. So much. It's like watching an old film. Watching him fade slowly in and out of frame. Black. I closed my eyes. I realized after a mere two seconds. But it seems it's too late. I'm staring at an empty window. I can see where he huffed his warm breath against the thin, transparent panel. But it didn't last in the cold. The form condensation slowly disappears, and as does my previous minuscule sense of security. Even if I'd been tired, I'm awake now, trembling. My body feels it's both been set aflame and buried with ice. I feel so numb that I can't move. My wide eyes form tears and I start to cry. I can't stop, though I am as silent as I can manage. My teeth grit to hold in my pathetic whimpers, the strain proving too much for my head. It's throbbing with pain. I want to cry out, but I can't. I keep my eyes open, staring forward from the wooden wall I backed up into. Glaring at the window, being able to see him there had been some source of comfort. But now he's gone. Where is he? I'm scared. I sit, tucking my knees close to my pounding chest. I bring up my nerve-rattling hands to bury my eyes into them, rubbing them dry. For a second, I can't see. I feel something brush against my shoulder, leaving my heart to sink and my cries to drown silent. I'm hesitant, but I remove my hands from my eyes until I stare into my lap. It's so quiet that I can hear my own shuddering breath as if it were the loudest thing I'd ever been able to hear. I eventually turn my head to look to the floor at my side. Nothing. Click. Just when I thought I'd been feeling my worst, I let out another baffled whimper, having a hand swipe away a single tear that sprinted along my fluster cheek. My eyes move across the floor and towards the door leading to the passageway. It's cracked open. I wait for it to be pushed open further. The anticipation making me nauseous. Ugh. There. Pale, but dirty and familiar aberrant fingers protrude from the side of the slightly open entryway. They tap on the wood just above the golden turning handle, concisely from pinky to thumb. I watch his fingers with eyes that grow dim. Although I'm scared, I accept my fate. I can't be saved. I mustered a sarcastic, short laugh at my misfortune, softly banging the back of my head into the wall I lean back against. I give up. I close my eyes. Having murdered his brother-in-law, Oren Brower of Kentucky was a fugitive from justice. From the county jail where he had been confined to await his trial, he'd escaped by knocking down his jailer with an iron bar, robbing him of his keys and opening the outer door, walking out into the night. The jailer being unarmed, Brower got no weapon with which to defend his recovered liberty. As soon as he was out of the town, he had the folly to enter a forest. This was many years ago, when that region was wilder than it is now. The night was pretty dark, and neither moon nor stars were visible, and as Brower had never dwelt thereabout, and knew nothing of the lay of the land, he has naturally not long in losing himself. He could not have said if he were getting farther away from the town or going back to it, a most important matter to Oren Brower. He knew that in either case, a posse of citizens with a pack of bloodhounds would soon be on his track, and his chance of escape was very slender. But he did not wish to assist in his own pursuit. Even an added hour of freedom was worth having. Suddenly, he emerged from the forest into an old road 
and there before him saw indistinctly the figure of a man, motionless in the gloom. It was too late to retreat. The fugitive felt at the first movement back toward the wood he would be, as he afterward explained, filled with buckshot. So the two stood there like trees. Brower, nearly suffocated by the activity of his own heart, the other, the emotions of the other, are not recorded. A moment later, it may have been an hour, the moon sailed into a patch of unclouded sky, and the hunted man saw that visible embodiment of law lift an arm and point significantly toward and beyond him. He understood. Turning his back to his captor, he walked submissively away in the direction indicated, looking to neither the right nor the left, hardly daring to breathe, his head and back actually aching with a prophecy of buckshot. Brower was as courageous a criminal as ever lived to be hanged. That was shown by the conditions of awful personal peril in which he had coolly killed his brother-in-law. It is needless to relate them here. They came out at his trial, and the revelation of his calmness in confronting them came near to saving his neck. But what would you have? When a brave man is beaten, he submits. So they pursued their journey, jailward along the old road through the woods. Only once did Brower venture a turn of the head, just once, when he was in deep shadow, and he knew the other was in moonlight. He looked backward. His captor was Burton Duff, the jailer, as white as death and bearing upon his brow the livid mark of the iron bar. Orne Brower had no further curiosity. Eventually, they entered the town, which was all all right, but deserted. Only the women and children remained, and they were off the streets. Straight toward the jail, the criminal held his way. Straight up to the main entrance, he walked, laid his hand upon the knob of the heavy iron door, pushed it open without command, entered, and found himself in the presence of a half-dozen armed men. Then he turned. Nobody else entered. On a table in the corridor lay the body of Burton Duff. Today is the first day of my new job as a teacher at the high school I once graduated from. Other than the fact at how damn early I had to get up, I was 100% ecstatic and ambitious towards what may happen on my first day back there. 5.30 a.m. came all too quickly. I was in and out of the shower, dressed and ready, coffee in hand by 5.55. I hastily locked up my apartment and made my way to the car. I fumbled around a little in the darkness while trying to get into my car but eventually I got it. I started to drive down my street. I had to take it slow due to ice. Lots of ice. A black figure began to appear in my field of vision. It was the shape of a man, all in black, walking slowly down the road. This struck as odd to me. 6 a.m. and someone is walking? In this weather? It had to be at least minus two degrees outside. And this guy is walking? Everything moved in slow motion as I thought about what he might be doing here. Why would he be walking? Where would he be walking to? Then my mind began to be enveloped by my fierce senses and I began thinking things that were completely irrational. Perhaps he's some sort of serial killer, I thought. Maybe he might pull out a 45 and blow my head off as I drive past him. My mind continued driving deeper into these paranoid delusions as I drew closer to my mystery man. His form became clearer as I inched closer with my headlights. I could make out more of his form. He was wearing a black work coat, 
It appeared to be dirty and covered in snow. He was wearing black pants and combat boots. The laces were not tied. A hood from presumably another jacket beneath the work coat hid his head from view. With a description like that, there were two possibilities in my mind. Homeless or crazy. Eventually realizing how insane I was being over a walking man, I snapped myself back into reality and shook off my dreadful thinking. Listen to yourself, you're being ridiculous, I scolded myself. I couldn't 100% shake my uneasiness. However, I wasn't going to let a simple oddity like this drive me to insanity. I brushed off whatever trance I was in and continued driving towards him. But then, however, something happened that I never saw coming. The man stopped walking. He stood there in my headlights, and as soon as I noticed he had stopped, I slammed my brakes and halted as well. My heart began to race, and my stomach did loops for reasons I did not understand. But I do now. He started to turn towards me. He was going to look at me. As he slowly turned, my heart pumped faster. Then to my horror, I finally saw the face of this man. If you can even call it a man. His eyes were shrouded in a blackness that was darker than the night around us. His white pupils glowed in the center of those pits as he stared into my very being. His nose wasn't there. In its place was a crude sewing together of the flesh around it, pulling his skin tightly across his bony face. His lips were not existent, revealing every single one of his jagged, chipped, decaying teeth. His gums were rotted and frostbitten. He was as pale as the snow around him. We made eye contact, and as we did, my heart grew to a place I didn't think possible. I was certain I was going to die here, but survival instincts kicked in and I put the pellet to the floor. I drove straight at the thing, but when I got within feet of him, he vanished completely, sending me into a head-on collision with a telephone pole. I was sent through the windshield and into the snow below. As soon as I hit the ground, my body began going numb. Aside from the pain in my chest and the shooting pain down my left leg, I was going to die there. My vision began to fade, and as it did, I looked up to find him towering over me, staring down at me. Then everything went black. I woke up in the hospital bed the next morning. Apparently, the neighbors were awakened by the crash and found me just in time. When the police asked me what had happened, I gave them a description of the man. Of course, they thought it was some sort of hallucination. So here I am, sitting in this room. I'll be here for another week or so. I'm typing this on a laptop the hospital was so kind to allow me to use while I'm here. But I won't be here much longer. My friend came to visit me today. The friend I met that night. The friend who tried to show me the true world. He's here now. He's sitting next to me, telling me everything is going to be okay. He's my master now. I belong to him. He's watching me. He was always watching me, from the day I was born to the day I die. And he's watching you, right now. It all started after moving into my new house. Yeah, that's pretty cliche. Believe me, I know. But it's what happened. I never experienced anything supernatural before, and though interested, I never really expected anything to happen to me. I was able to rent the house for pretty cheap. I didn't think anything of it because it was old and not in the best of neighborhoods. So I guess I just got a good deal. After moving everything in, things were fine for a while. I don't remember exactly when it started because it seemed so minor at the time. I'd leave a light on in the kitchen or the bathroom and come back to find it off. Honestly, I thought I was just forgetting that I turned them off already when I came back. After a while, 
I began to wonder and started leaving a couple lights on on purpose. Sometimes nothing would happen. Sometimes I'd come back to find the lights turned off. By now, I figured out that something was off. I wasn't really scared, but just confused. I thought maybe something was wrong with the electronics. I started leaving lights on a bit more often because I thought I might be able to get some sign of why they would randomly shut off. That's when it started to take another turn. The first real time I remember something crazy happening was when I left the kitchen and living room light on while I was asleep. I woke up to a deep, rumbling growl coming from the kitchen. Now, from the bedroom, you can see down the hall to the living room, and that room is connected to the kitchen. I remember waking up and thinking that there was an animal or something in my house. I looked down the hall toward the living room to see the light darken. Somebody had flicked off the light from the kitchen. Another low growl came, this time from the living room, and I nearly screamed as I saw something bolt across the length of the hall, opening, and then the living room light went out. I couldn't tell exactly what it was, though. It just seemed like a black shadow or something. It didn't really matter. I was scared shitless. I bolted from my bed and then threw on the bedroom light, expecting something to be in the room and getting ready to come after me. Nothing. There wasn't anything in the room. I let out a low breath and then I slowly moved down the hall into the living room. Once I got to the end, I practically ran to throw on the light switch there. Again, nothing kitchen next, and once again, nothing. I was starting to think I dreamed all of it before I went to turn off the kitchen light and stop. Now, I was a grown man, but here I was, terrified to turn off that switch. And I'll admit it, I slept with all the lights on that night. That was a mistake. When I woke up the next morning, all the lights were off once again. I went to push myself out of bed and winced as my body felt sore. I pulled the sheets off to see long red marks running down along my legs and arms. It looked like something scratched me in the night. That terrified the hell out of me but not nearly so much as what I saw around the house. Every light I left on was smashed. Every light bulb that was on last night was broken. Every lamp knocked over and smashed in. My breath caught in my throat as I looked around. Something was fucked up as hell here and something tried to, well, do something to me. I called in for work that day and went to immediately replace all the lights. I didn't know what to do then. I thought about leaving, but, and I know this probably sounds stupid, but this was my home. It was my first time away from my family, and this was my home. I couldn't give it up, so I stayed. Even as it got worse, even though I was beginning to become terrified of the dark, I couldn't really sleep with the light on me at night in the bedroom. I'd leave other lights on though, like in the hall or the living room, giving myself enough to see pretty well in my darker room. And almost every night, I'd wake up in the middle of the night to hear something growling and prowling around the living room, 
and then the light would shut off. I didn't want to go look. I was terrified at the thought of being in the same room with whatever was in there. So I curled up in bed and prayed it never came in. One night, after this went on for a while, I had had it. I bought a gun and turned on every light in the house. Then I sat down in the middle of the living room with my gun in my lap and a baseball bat sitting next to me. I waited. There was nothing at first for a long time. At around two in the morning, I began to hear it. Oddly, it was behind me. I turned and peeked toward the hall to my bedroom and could hear that familiar growl. I swallowed and held my gun in one hand and the bat in the other and slowly began to step around to get a better view of the bedroom from the living room. As I began to get a better view of my bed, I heard a loud thump, followed by an inhuman roar. I, being the brave man I was, jumped back and away from the hallway. I wanted to end this all. Dear God, I didn't want to deal with that thing. I could hear tearing and smashing, but I don't know how to call it. But I did manage to hear an audible click, and then nothing. Slowly, I went back to peek down the hall, and the light was off once again. A deep breath, and I ventured forth, my weapons ready. When I came to my bedroom and flicked the light back on, I gasped. My bed was ravaged, torn completely apart. It was like some animal had jumped into it and just ripped it to shreds. I stepped forward to look at what was left of my bed and just stood in shock for who knows when. It wasn't until I heard the sound of a familiar growl that I turned around. Standing near my door, right at the light switch, was when I finally saw it. It was a man, a white and rotting man with a mangled body that looked like he had once been a dog's chew toy, staring at me. I was too in shock to even raise my weapons. He stared at me for just a moment and then flicked off the light. I screamed. I'm not even ashamed to admit it. I screamed and bolted. I didn't care if that was where that man had been standing. I ran right past where I'd seen him, swinging my bat like a madman. I nearly put a hole in the hallway as I ran through into the safe light of the hall. I turned to look back then, just in time to see him once again near the hall's light switch. He turned that one off too. By then, I didn't want to fight. I wanted to be safe. I burst past the living room and into the brightness of my kitchen. I heard the sound of growling and scratching nearly all around me. Then I knew he was coming back. I looked back to once again see that mangled and rotten corpse of a man turn off another light with a broken finger and plunge me into terrifying darkness. I broke for the living room. This was going to be my final stand. I'd have to fight here. I drew close to the standing lamp that was my last line of defense. It hated the dark, so I'd stay right here next to this comforting standing light. I waited for it to turn off, but it never did. I looked around and quiet, nothing but quiet. I turned then to look at the savage grace of a lamp that refused to yield. I started to find myself laughing, a crazy but alive laugh, and I thought I'd finally be okay. I stepped closer, and I swear I almost hugged that lamp until I saw it. 
I heard the growl first, coming not from behind me, but in front, from that lamp. My eyes widened, and I stared as the light from that lamp intensified. I stumbled back, and I don't know what happened, but I think I tripped on something. I just know I found myself flat on my back, staring up at the bright, intense light. It wasn't comforting any longer, just hot and heavy and bright. I thought it was going to burn me away, and then it came. I don't have words to describe what poured from that lamp's light. It was hideous, twisted, and filled with rage. I know I'll never forget those eyes, though. Bright, hot, and white, two glowing circles of pure malice. It hated me. It hated everything about me. And not just me. It hated all of us. Every human being. But it was stuck here. And it would lash out at what it could. Me. I don't know how I knew this. But I just knew. It lunged for me. And I prepared myself for a painful death. Click. The light went out. Once again, darkness. Sweet, quiet, relaxing darkness. I stayed on the ground for a long moment, letting my eyes adjust as I kept my gaze fixated on where my standing lamp was. As the seconds passed, I could start to make him out. That mangled man, standing by the lamp, one torn hand upon the switch as he looked down at me. I understood then. I understood what it all meant. Everything that happened. The man pulled his hand away from it and then pointed a mangled finger toward it before, very clearly shaking his head from side to side. All I could find myself doing was nodding. He wasn't the one trying to harm me. All this time, all those instances, he was trying to protect me. The creature could only come in the light, and this mangled man had been trying to keep me safe. He didn't want someone else to repeat his mistakes. I moved out the very next day and never looked back. Whatever it was, it was confined to that house. And so far, nothing has come at me from another light source. However, that thing will always stick with me in my mind. Every night in my new apartment, I made a habit of wandering around the house making sure every light is off, every curtain is closed, and made sure to plunge myself in quiet, comforting, and safe pitch darkness. It started with a whisper faintly appearing on the wind. Psst! Lorenith glanced around the field she was in, but after not seeing anyone, she went back to her task, picking the most beautiful flowers she could find and laying them in a basket. Today was her birthday, and she had proudly told anyone she had met that she was turning nine years old today, and soon she will be an adult. Psst. She looked up, feeling goosebumps appear on her skin as she glanced around again, still not seeing anybody. She looked down at the daisy she had just picked and recoiled in horror, throwing it with a scream. Her eyes watched as the daisy, that was now a black, rotting thing, sailed through the air, disappearing amongst the many flowers in the field. She stared at the spot it had disappeared breathing heavily at the shock. Psst. 
It was louder this time, making her whirl around in search of the intruder. Uh, who's there? She yelled. No answer. This isn't funny! Again, no answer. She felt a chill creep into her spine as she looked around the field, every which way. There was a rustling, which her head snapped towards, before realizing the wind was making all the plants sway lazily. She shivered, despite the sunlight beaming down on her. She quickly started heading towards the village, basket in hand. She hurried, bursting into the front door of her home. Mama! I got some, she called out. No answer. Mama? Again, no answer. She slowly crept through the house, searching for any sign of her mother. She heard the floor creak and whipped around to face the noise, not seeing anything. She crept towards the back room, the room that belonged to her mother. As she got nearer, it came back. Psst! Nervously looking around, Lorinath still couldn't see anyone. The house suddenly got dark. All light seemed to disappear into the shadows. Uh, who's there? What? What do you want f with me? She managed to shut her out. There was no answer. She took another step towards her mother's room, before the sound came again. Psst! Glancing around fearfully, she darted forward into her mother's room, only to see a figure standing over the still form of her mother. The figure was wrapped in a black robe and seemed to be staring at her. Leronif gulped as she looked towards where the face would be, only to see nothing but a shadow. So... The figure slowly faded out of view, seeming to dissolve into the thin air. Lorenith rubbed her eyes to make sure she wasn't seeing things before running over to her mother. Mama! No answer. She wasn't moving. Lorenith bolted, running outside and searching for the nearest person she could find. As she glanced around, an uneasy feeling appeared in the pit of her stomach. Her village seemed... empty. She ran to the nearest house pounding on the door and screaming for help. The door slowly creaked inwards, but there was nobody there. She cautiously walked in, exploring, and found the people, on the floor, unmoving. Lareneth screamed and ran, but the next house was the same. Everyone was silent, lifeless. She ran from house to house, tears streaming down her face as she screamed and yelled for someone, anyone to help her. There was no answer to her cries. She went through the entire village, only to find that she was the last one alive. As she looked around in her hysteria, she noticed the robed figure from her house earlier. The cloth moved as if the figure was pointing at her. But there's no visible limb, only shadow. So... The voice echoed around her. She dropped to her knees, sobbing before laying out the loudest scream she possibly could. She screamed as she sat up, in her bed, swaying profusely, glancing around. It was just a dream, she muttered to herself. Larineth, come eat. Breakfast is ready. She heard her mother yell from the kitchen. It was just a dream. She reassured herself before going to the kitchen. After eating and getting dressed for the day, her mother handed her a basket. Why don't you go pick some flowers, sweetie? The ones on the table are looking sad. Lerneth glanced behind her at the vase on the table. The flowers were indeed starting to wilt. She turned back and smiled. Okay, Mama. I'll get the prettiest flowers ever. She took off racing to the field, beginning to pick the flowers that stood out and caught her attention. Psst. It started with a whisper, faintly appearing on the wind. 